Good everyone. I just uh, an announcement before I begin. Uh, next week, I am uh, going to give the Parsha class back in Shul. And it'll be on Friday morning at 10 o'clock. It will be Zoomed for those of you that don't make it to shul and you want to hear it. It'll probably be of somewhat greater length than these sessions have been, but we're trying to get the, back to uh, what we once thought was normal. So uh, next Friday morning, uh, the, the Parsha of Bahar and Bechukotai will be presented in shul at 10 o'clock, you're all invited uh, and the, the Zoom will take place simultaneously. So you'll be able to listen even if you don't come to show. Second uh, announcement is that this Monday night at 8.30, again in shul, uh, I'm beginning a new Destiny lecture series on uh, the influence of individual Jews and Judaism generally on the non-Jewish world. And that's at 8.30 in Shul. And again, you can get it on Zoom, but you have to contact okay. Amsel to be able to get the link to the Zoom. And Rabbi Amsel can be reached at 054 Four five four three six one eight. Okay, those are the commercials, and I thank you for your patience. <clears throat> this week's parsha of Emor deals with the colony. Emor la colony Aaron, and there are entire sets of laws and halachas restrictions and challenges that are presented to those who are members of the Kahuna, the family and descendants of Aro. The Haftorah of this week's Parsha, which is what I wish to discuss with you, is taken from the Novi Scharia. Akoanim Alavim Bene Tzodok, Asher Shomru Es Mishmarti, Besos Bene Yisroel Meolai, Emo Yikribu Elai Lishor Seyi. Meaning the Koanim, who are called also Levim, as I would be coined, is also a Levi, who are the descendants of Aaron. Uh, that come close to uh, worship me and serve me. And they were the ones that kept the faith. When the Jewish people wandered away from me. So I want to discuss with you the background of this Haftorah because I think it has great relevance to our time. And it also has moral lessons that all of us can easily incorporate in our daily lives and in our attitudes towards people and events. The first temple is destroyed. The Jewish people go into exile. 52 years later, they're threatened with annihilation by Haman in the famous Purim story, at the time of Mordechai and Esther, the Jewish people once again, they renew their bond to Torah. This time they do so voluntarily at Har Sinai, which we're going to celebrate and commemorate on Shavuos. Uh, the Gemara tells us 
The Jewish people were forced. They didn't really mean it. The Rabbi Shalom hung the mountain over their head. He said, if you take the Torah, good. If you don't take the Torah, I'm going to drop the mountain. That metaphor is meant to explain to us that the acceptance of the Torah was not voluntary. It was not from the inside, it was from the outside. We can understand that it was from the outside because they're so overwhelmed, it's a volcano, it's a fire, it's thunder and lightning and the sound of the shofar never ends. How can they say no? How can they say anything? They ran away. They stood away out of fear. And they will come back and say to Moshe, after, so to speak, the Lord had issued the first two of the Aseret HaDevorim, they'll come back and say, we don't want to hear any more straight from heaven. You teach us. You, the rest of it, you teach us. So Moshe is the one that said, Lotisa and Kabe Zavicha and Zohar Shomashabas. Moshe teaches them. They cannot bear to hear the voice of heaven. It's too overwhelming. So their acceptance of the Torah was, so to speak, with an element of coercion. It was not completely voluntary. They really had no choice. And that was the complaint of the nations of the world that they said, you offered the Torah to us, but you didn't offer it to us in the same way that you offered it to the people of Israel. People of Israel had no choice, so therefore they said, Nasev and Ishmael. We had a choice, so therefore uh, we chose an easy way out, not realizing what the Torah really was. But in Purim time, the Jewish people accepted the Torah voluntarily. Because after Oman, they have a choice. The miracle of Purim is a hidden miracle. It's not thunder and lightning. If you will, it can be explained as simply a political machination, having no spiritual value to it at all. So the Jewish people have a choice. They can continue to be Jewish, but they realize there's a price involved. The price involved is there always is a homon. We uh, said on the Seder night, there always is a uh, a Khomeini and a Farrakhan and all of these guys. They never go away. And if one of them is crushed, another one arises. So the Jewish people have a choice. You want to accept the Torah and be a special people with all the liabilities that are involved in being a special people. Because the world resents special people. Or do you want to quit? So we read in the Novi Yechevsko 
that there was an element of the Jewish people that wanted to quit. They said, base Israel. We're going to be just like all the nations of the world. We don't want to be a special people. But the covenant that the Lord had made with us uh, does not allow us to uh, unilaterally withdraw that way. But after Purim, the Jewish people came over and they agreed, okay, we're going to stick with it. We're going to be the Jewish people. And if we're going to be the Jewish people, we understand the challenge that is involved. But we accept it upon ourselves because, uh, to put it bluntly, we feel it worth the effort. We're happy with it. So, almost two decades later, uh, the exile ends. They have permission from the government. Then it's the Persian government that ruled Palestine to return to the land of Israel, to rebuild Jerusalem, and to rebuild the temple. And this is the time of Ezra. Ezra is one of the most dramatic figures in all of Jewish history. The rabbis compared him to Moshe Rabbeinu himself. We would not have had the Torah through Moshe, and we would have had it through Ezra. Meaning that Ezra is the second lawgiver. He's the one who rebuilds the Jewish people. He builds it through Torah Shabbat there, through the oral law. And he comes to do the Anshe Knesset Akola, the men of the great assembly, to help form the physical and spiritual nature of the new Jewish commonwealth, which is to be erected in the land of Israel. But Ezra is met with disappointment. He thought that once permission is given and you can have open immigration to the land of Israel, hundreds of thousands of Jews would take advantage of the, of the situation, of the opportunity. They would come, especially the mighty Jewish community of Bogel, steeped in Torah. Many great rabbis and scholars. And that community would be, uh, to a certain extent, the major community in the Jewish world for the next thousand years. It would develop the Talmud. It would create the entire structure of Jewish tradition and halacha. But they did not come back. They stayed in Bogom. And Ezra was only able to gather around him Poultry, 42,000 immigrants. And the Gomorrah and Kedushin points out to us that these immigrants were of all of the classes of the Jewish people, but not necessarily the elite, not necessarily the most kosher. The Mishnah in 
Kedushin says, Asura, you've seen over the Bovel. From Bovel came 10 different degrees of Yichas. Some of them are not so honorable. Mamzerim, Gerim, Shisuki, all kinds of people. Questionable pedigrees. And uh, Gemara points out that Bovel, the Jews in Bovel had impeccable pedigree. Ezra didn't come back until he made sure that everyone in Bovel was legitimate. There was no question of who is a Jew in Bovel. The question of who is a Jew was always an Eretz Israel. And therefore, uh, Ezra is faced with a monumental task. Now, coming back to the land of Israel, so the Kohanim have to come back if we're going to have a temple. If the Beit HaMikdash is going to function, so we have to have Kohanim. And the Kohanim have to be Mu'chosim. They have to be of unquestionable pedigree. They have to be true Kohanim. And a lot of things happened over 70 years. We look back at our own lifetime. We look back, the Lord has granted it to us that we can look back 70 years. We realize a lot of happens. It's not the way the world was then. So, Yehoshua comes back to be the Kohen Godot. He's descended from Tzodok, who was the Kohen Godot at the time of David HaMelech. There were two streams of the family, one Tzodok and one Evyatar. Family of Tzodo eventually dominated the Kahuna Gdola. And they're the ones that came back. And they were loyal, observant, holy. The Novi says, I share Shomru as Mishmart. They guarded my heritage. And then you have these two words, the Jewish people took a wrong turn. The oath is to make a mistake. But we all know that uh, if you're driving on a uh, major highway and you miss the exit that you wanted, it may take you uh, quite a bit of time and many miles or kilometers before you can get another exit that will enable you to turn off and return and get back to where you want to go. If that's true as it is in uh, driving an automobile. It certainly is true regarding the general direction of human and Jewish society. There are times when society makes a great mistake. It makes a ta'ut, make a great mistake. Uh, we are witness uh, in the 20th century of societies, unbelievable societies intelligent societies, sophisticated societies, 
technologically advanced societies who made terrible mistakes and brought the world to disaster and their society with it as well. It was a mistake. Hitler was a mistake. Stalin was a mistake. Chairman Mao was a mistake. Al Pat was a mistake. We'll see the other mistakes that exist. Once a mistake is made, it's difficult to get back on the highway right away. It's hard to turn it around. I mentioned often the statistic that it takes uh, an aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean over 40 nautical miles in order to turn around. How much more so is it with the society and people who everyone has their own opinion? And people find it very difficult to admit that they made a mistake. The tragedy of human life is that people usually double down on their mistakes. Even they used to say that if co-op doesn't work, then we have to use more co-op. That's a uh, human failing. We invested so much in this belief, in this direction, and now we have to say it's wrong. All of the historians regarding the First World War, for instance, uh, asked the same question. The war began really in August, 1914. By uh, the end of November 1914, just three and a half months later, both sides realized that the war was almost unwinnable. And that the amount of casualties suffered it was unimaginable. So then why did they continue the war for the next four years? Why did he, uh, the war eventually was going to consume 35, 40 million people, soldiers, civilians, others? Destroy Europe, destroy the world. And it continued only because you can't admit that you made a mistake. Politically, you can't go back to your people and say, we made a mistake. We should never have entered the war. We didn't realize what was involved. We're going to withdraw, and try to make a peace, and try and say what we can. That didn't happen. And to a certain extent, it almost never happens. Because ha having suffered so many casualties already, how can you expect that we're going to come and say it was all for nothing? Even though we know it was all for nothing. So that's Pitos B'nai Yisrael Meola. The Jewish people made a mistake. They went off the rails. But no one can admit it. Instead, we see all the divisions that exist even today. Does anyone really believe that reform Judaism is going to be the solution? That it'll make more people Jewish? No one believes that. Not even the, the, the most reformative reform. Yet no one is willing to say that it was a mistake. There are tens of other examples such as that. 
So the Kohanim, the Bnei Tzodok, Yoshua, the Kohen Godol, they remain loyal because they were the ones that, so to speak, pointed out the mistake. They were not willing to accommodate the mistake. And therefore the Lord says, they will therefore be allowed to come close to me, to serve me, to help rebuild the second temple in a proper and meaningful way. There's a problem though that the Novi points out. There's an angel that he sees that standing next to Yoshua, the Kohen Gadol. And the angel is not friendly, let's put it that way. And the Sultan is there. The prosecuting angel. Angel that is unwilling to give the Jewish people slack for their misdeeds. And the Sultan is there to accuse Yahushua. And the Novi says, the Yahushua Hayolovush the God in Tzoi. Yahushua was dressed in garments that were stained and dirty. So the rabbi said, what does that mean? That he was dressed in garments that were stained and dirty? Is that Yoshua's own descendants, his own sons were intermarried? had violated the oath of the Kohanim, married foreign women. And at the time of Ezra, we read in the Tanakh that that was a very prevalent plague amongst the Jewish people. And Ezra had to rally the people to stem that tide. Unfortunately, we don't know the magic bullet that he used to do so. He was successful. But uh, the Jewish world today is ravaged by intermarriage. So here, how can Yoshua be a Kohen Godo? If so to speak, his own grandchildren are not Jewish. So his garments are stained. And if his garments are stained, then his authority is compromised. Then who's going to listen to him? What influence will he be? famous statement in the rabbis that if you tell me to take, you know, the uh, sliver out of my face, I'll tell you to take the piece of wood out of your eye. Meaning, who are you to tell me anything? And we see that uh, our community is uh, not perfect. We are always overwhelmed by scandals of individuals who uh, at one time or another were held in high esteem in our community. We thought them to be people of influence. And now they are a liability and an embarrassment, not only to themselves, but to us. And we are very reticent, therefore, to preach to others. 
tell others what to do when it doesn't seem to be working for us. So Yeshua is difficult, is in a difficult position. Yet the Novi says, Yeshua, you have to do it. You have to be the Kohen Godo. It's up to you. The fact that you have personal tragedies, the fact that it didn't work out the way you wanted to, that's immaterial to the task that you are entrusted and to the goal that you have to achieve. And then there's another character who is mentioned in the Haftorah as Rubovel. There's great the difference of opinion in Midrash who Zerubbabel really is. But whatever uh, opinion we follow, he certainly is a descendant of the house of David. And therefore he has the credentials or the monarchy over the Jewish people when they returned to the land of Israel. Now it so happens that the Persians will not allow a monarchy. So the most he can be is the head of the autonomy. And really Ezra, who is a Kohen, is the head of the Jewish people, not Zerubbabel. But Zerubbabel is supposed to occupy a place of influence. He's supposed to represent the majesty of the house of David. He's supposed to uh, give meaning to the hopes for the restoration of the house of David to leadership. He's supposed to personify, therefore, all of the greatness that is involved in that. So the Novi says, Zerubbabel is faced with a tremendous mountain. The task before him is so enormous, it's Mount Everest. He can't climb it. You're asking the impossible. Then the Novi says the mountain will become a plain, a plateau. But Zerubbabel has to attempt to climb it and master it. The Sultan says it can't be done because that always is the language of the Sultan. It's the uh, naysayers that exist in the world. Any good project, somebody will say it can't be done. Or they'll say you're not the one to do it. Or don't even attempt it. But the greatness of the Jewish people is its resilience. And the fact that Zubovel will flatten the mountain and Yoshua will be the Kohen Godot and the Kohanim Alevi and B'nai Tzodot will Yikrevu Elishor say me will come close to me and serve me the temple will be rebuilt now it may not be the temple that we dreamt of There'll be things that are missing. But that is a false view of the accomplishments. Perfection always eludes human effort. It is purposely done so 
so that there are always our goals to achieve, projects to complete, and good deeds to be accomplished. If we had a perfect world, we'd have no reason to get up in the morning. So the example of the second temple, which is what this Aftora really is, it really can serve as a template for us as we are building the third commonwealth. The enormous projects that exist before us spiritual, moral, political, economic, technological, security. You make a list. So if you take a look at it, so then you don't want to get out of bed in the morning. But the Torah does not allow that for us. And the fact that the host, B'nai Yisrael, the Mayolai, that many have taken such a wrong turn, it's also not an excuse. We have to be the Kohanim Levi and B'nai Tzodok, Asher Shomru Es Mishmarti. Hold on to the tradition. To rebuild it, strengthen it, educate others in it. And the Sultan will stand and say no. And in our long and um, glorious history of contending with the Sultan. Jewish people have the power to prevail. And we have that power too. And that therefore is the message of this Aftorah. At the end, uh, great things will happen. Now we all have a Torah in the uh, about lighting the candle, writing the menorah, which is the twin to this Torah. Both of them have to be seen together as one. And the great menorah therefore is within our power to light and to illuminate the society that we live in. So I want to thank you all for listening. I don't wish you a happy and smoke-free Lag Bomer. And uh, again, next week, the Parsha Shir will be Friday morning on Bahar Bahukotai. Thank you for listening. Call to Sela. Okay. Thank you.